Okay, everybody. Um, everybody can take their seats. We will uh, start our meeting in about a second. Very good. If you can all stand, we'll uh, pledge allegiance to our flag. Thank you all. Madam Clerk, if you can call the roll. Councilmember Bill De La Pena. Yes, uh, present. Councilmember Adam. Here. Councilmember McNamee. Here. Mayor Pro, Pro Tem Jones is absent. And Mayor Engler. Here. Just a quick question, a quick note about um, Councilmember Jones. He was, um, there's a long standing family history of getting together for 4th of July. And um, that was a better choice than being here, I think. So um, welcome, thanks to him for, for having been part of this. He was gonna attend via um, electronics, but apparently his uh, internet failed on him. So we'll just have to do without his, per his wisdom tonight. Okay, we do have a quick announcement. Um, Items 11A and 11B, the Council on Aging and the Youth Commission, um, we're gonna move those up on the calendar and hear them right after our consent calendar. So, but first, we have a very good uh, presentation to make, so let me move down to the podium and we'll make our presentation. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, tonight, very happy to make a, uh, a special presentation. Uh, pleased to have an opportunity to talk about our incredible Parks and Recreation District. I, uh, we have uh, in the house, we have Susan Holt, Vice Chair of the Caneo Recreation and Parks District, uh, Board of Directors, as well as the General Manager, Jim F uh, Friedel, for, to join us here. So come on up, guys. Any, anyone who lives here in Thousand Oaks um, knows about the Canelo Recreation and Parks District and how it's an integral part of the city. Um, those of us on the council know that anything that you do good, we get credit for and we appreciate <laughs> that. Um, the programs that you have uh, established and maintain our quality of life and ensure the health of our residents and contribute to our economic and environmental well-being. We have tremendous appreciation for all the, the CRPD board does and the staff that allows us to have a world-class park and recreational programs. It is therefore my honor on behalf of the entire city council to proclaim July as Parks and Recreation Month. Thank you very much. I will have this and we have a camera today. And we'll just okay. present this to Jim. Cool. Okay. And Susan, please go ahead. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to stand in for uh, our chair, Nellie Cussworth, who is out of town, and the entire board I'm, I'm representing, and thank the city council for this recognition uh, and showing up the importance of parks, recreation, and open space. Uh, we are here tonight because cities and counties throughout the country are proclaiming July as Parks and Recreation Month. Well, I've lived here for, uh, since 1980, and I've been on the board of CRPD for 28 years. So I know the city, the city of Thousand Oaks, and I know they value and support CRPD and the services that we provide, not just in July, of course, but all year long. 
So day in and day out, CRPD provides over 60 parks and special facilities. We offer thousands of recreation programs at locations all over the city. We provide and host dozens of community events, and we jointly manage our open space through COSCA. We couldn't do that without our wonderful staff, our dedicated staff, and the volunteers we have, as well as dozens of partnerships and collaborations. And CRPD has no better and more dedicated partner than the city of Thousand Oaks. Thank you. <laughs> well, your support of CRPD and our joint endeavors are critical to the quality of life that we enjoy in this wonderful city. So again, thank you on behalf of CRPD and happy Parks and Recreation Month. Get out and enjoy your parks. <laughs> Yeah, we want a picture with the mayor. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> picture. Um. Mayor Engler, I just wanted to make a quick comment regarding this presentation, if I may. Go right ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to say how special CRPD is because if you paid attention to what they were doing for 4th of July, there is no agency that does as much to celebrate 4th of July as CRPD. And it started with a pancake breakfast in the morning, yep. right? Right. And then, and then there was a home run derby uh, contest. Yes. Then there was another for home run derby for seniors. Then you were able to take fun in the pool at CLU and I believe at um, a Newberry Park High School. Then a concert, and then of course a concert in the park that was attended by thousands um, yesterday. It was well attended. Yes, <laughs> very well attended. And then at night, of course, the annual tradition of fireworks, fireworks. and and all of that was free. So yeah. have to you have to think about it. This is fantastic, and and it takes a lot of effort and dedication to put on shows and events all day long. And that's just the Fourth of July, and you do so much more the rest of the year. Just wanted to say thank you for making Fourth of July special You're for welcome. us. You're welcome. And these are things that we've done year after mm -hmm. year. So um, it's wonderful. <laughs> I take part in most of them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Claudia. Thank you, Ms. Bill de la Pena. Uh, before I go on, I want to go off script just for, for a little bit. Um, one thing that uh, Council Member Jones wanted to make sure we recognize this year is the outstanding uh, achievements of some of our kids in our, our school, the school district and other schools in the, in the area. Um, just a, a few of the highlights. Over, over Westlake High School, Six, 53 kids with a 4.6 average or more. Um, I used to be able to count that high, but that's, that's an amazing achievement. Uh, girls tennis at Westlake, number one in the nation. Uh, the marching band won Division 2A. Amazing things that these people have done. Um, over at Newberry Park High School, do we have to even talk about their, their uh, um, cross country team? and this sterling amount of work that they did. All across our, our area, if you ever wanna just know that our future is safe, just look at the achievements of some of these kids 
and uh, you'll know that we're gonna be okay going into the future. So hats off to our other partner in the area, our schools, our recreation and parks district, and the city form a triad of uh, abilities that we're trying to make this a better place every day, all day. So with that, Madam Clerk, can you please read uh, our public announcement? Public this speaker's is a, announcement? This is a time and place for public comments. All remarks should be addressed to the council as a whole. Speakers are requested to state their name and community of residence for the record. One individual has requested to speak and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes and the yellow light displays when you have one minute remaining. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We do have one speaker, it's Suzanne Schmitz. Please come ahead, Ms. Schmitz. Sorry about my phone, sorry about that. Okay. Hi, so I'm Suzanne Schmitz. I think you might remember me from last week. I live in Thousand Oaks. I hope you had a good fourth. It was spectacular, as always. Um, I wanted to talk about the idea of a 101 biotech corridor which I support. Uh, the development is a good one for our employers. We need more housing, both commercial and residential gentrification of old buildings and old neighborhoods. However, what we do not need is projects that allow protected oaks to be removed and replaced with non-native trees. We also do not need any project that limits the view of the Santa Monica Mountains. On behalf of 69 residents and 43 children who agree with me, here's the artwork I forgot to give you last week. The city council has not focused on trees, it's obvious. Now that we have a drought, it's even easier to ignore. What you're missing is that heritage oaks were created to survive drought. Non-native mitigation trees were not, and they will die in drought conditions. It's clear that last week the Baxter project was decided about five years ago. Unfortunately, the majority of people find out about projects after approval and are not aware of them, and the word protected oak is skillfully left out of the reports. The reasons are clear that it seems like they're not being focused on. LA County is giving away trees. Ventura County's goal is to plant 1,000 trees. Yet last week in Thousand Oaks, several oaks at the Amgen property, buildings 34, 35, and 36 were removed, and the Baxter Project was approved to remove oak trees and sycamores. We have a wildlife bridge for cougars but TO manipulates a law to cut down our protected oaks. There's a California Wildlife Foundation and the California Oaks Coalition, who are very active throughout our state, yet our city council is completely deaf when it comes to valuing heritage oak trees. The agenda is obvious, high density and inclusivity. Where do the oaks fit? Don't we want oaks to be around for everyone, all exclusive, all inclusive? The city should require all future developers to design around and uphold the protected tree law and only allow replacement trees to be California native. We need to hear why the city's not even, why they're not suing Sacramento like other cities. By the following the high density directive, you're making our city become Woodland Hills or Oxnard. I know you've heard it before. It's obviously there's no concern. There's a fire evacuation hazard. The 2018 evacuation was dangerous. I drove through that. The projects that are adding will allow more vehicles. What is the city doing to help with the evacuation plan? The floods and the, in, the roads and the infrastructure. Water, the Baxter development said last week that the council meeting that their plumbing fixtures would be good for water conservation. Yet water supply was a five minute discussion. Finally, is it not inclusive that baby boomers like myself we're allowed to grow up with heritage oaks. If you continue to allow them to be removed, the next diverse and younger generation will never know what a heritage oak is and why you made laws to protect thank, it. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Appreciate Sorry. it. Um, Ms. Schmidt was our only, no, your only, only speaker tonight. Um, so now we go to uh, city manager for comments. Um, 
Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just obviously uh, spoke briefly to it last week. Um, the Thousand Oaks City Council and the City of Thousand Oaks has some of the most stringent tree protection uh, requirements in Ventura County. Um, and uh, they include a landmark tree ordinance, uh, oak tree preservation and protection standards, and they're all designed to do just what, uh, uh, what our speaker was talking about, which is preserve those heritage oaks for generations to come. Um, uh, all anyone that's interested in the public um, toaks.org slash trees uh, is our uh, site uh, that has all links to all of our various preservation standards and uh, I think uh, you know we all take trees very seriously here in this community as part of uh, obviously part of our namesake that's all thank you uh, mr. powers um, we now are going to our consent calendar. Um, Ms. Bill de la Pena. Thank you, Mayor Engler. I would like to pull item 7D as in dog and F as in Frank. D and F. That's D, David. F, Frank. Okay. Very good. Any other uh, pulls? Then I'll entertain a motion for the, con the balance of the consent. Move the balance. Very good, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Bill De La Pena? Yes. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Jones is absent and Mayor Angler? Yes. And that motion carries 4 0 with Mayor Pro Tem Jones absent. Okay, Ms. Bill De La Pena. Thank you. Uh, 7D is fairly, it's really just housekeeping. Um, in transferring authority to the city manager during the uh, summer recess. And I was wondering, can we give Mr. Powers authority to engage with, where necessary, other agencies or partners when it comes to the emergency housing um, location? If something comes up over the, over the summer, can we give Mr. Mr. Powers authority to deal with that rather than having the council be called for a special meeting when people may be out? Mr. Mayor, I would say I'm sorry that you probably cannot, you cannot add to the agenda for, with this issue. Um, it is something that we, we prepared for the upcoming summer, just those items that were specifically listed. Yeah. And um, maybe, it, it, and the, Mr. Heer is correct, and maybe yeah. if I add to that, um, in the event that um, that a property acquisition or a property issue were to come, come right. about, um, it would require convening of the council to address that, because uh, I don't, regardless of what authority you provide, wouldn't have the authority to move into real estate transaction-based discussions or contractual discussions that are binding of that. So we would handle that in, in a manner of, of trying to convene the council in, in, in whether it's virtual or otherwise. To address. What about a temporary location for a warming shelter? Is that something that we need to convene the council as well? Without anything specific on the horizon, it's hard to say uh, okay. what, the, what the need would be, but you know, certainly that's consistent with councils. Working on homelessness solutions is consistent with council's priority. And so Absolutely. Our, uh, so we're gonna continue to work on those efforts um, consistent with council priority regardless of uh, okay. whether we're recess I, or not. And then in the event that something presented itself and we needed to do that, we would. Okay, no, I just wanna make sure we're not missing an opportunity. Uh, but it sounds like uh, whatever we do, we need to call a council meeting. Right. I mean, it, okay. it, the, the issue is being specific. So you would have the, the correct direction for a city manager and, and staff to act. And we can't do that with a speculation, right? These We have many concepts that might happen. Mm -hmm. uh, what we would have to do is, based upon the circumstances, we might have to, unfortunately, call a special meeting if it came to that, just because of the urgency of that mm -hmm. and the need for that. But uh, right now, without specific you know a specific concept and a specific uh, project okay we can't do that all right and specific just i will stop here because i know we're probably running afoul but it, those the winter warming shelter has traditionally been run by nonprofit religious organizations and so in that event we try to follow that same model if we go and i know uh, mrs hardy is is continuing to work through those dialogues uh, as well with those various partners yeah i've been trying to find out whether there will be a winter shelter this year and it seems like it's in limbo but um again i i'm not I just wanted to see if, if that was an option. Okay, um, with that, I move approval of uh, 7D. Very good, Madam Clerk, on 7D. 
Council Member Bill Dillapena? Yes. Council Member Adam? Yes. Council Member McNamee? Yes. And Mayor Engler? Yes. And that motion carries 4 0 with Council or Mayor Pro Tem Jones absent. Madam Bill de la Pena um, on, on uh, C7 Frank. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question about the farm worker housing study. That is something where every city has to participate. And um, for this particular study for very low income housing, it, are the are uh, ranchers or farmers required to participate in this as well financially or is it just the public agencies? Um, right now the county is the lead agency on this. I'll let Mr. Parker speak to that. Um, the county approached all the cities um, because all the cities are going through their housing element updates and farm worker housing is a state mandated portion of what needs to be addressed within there and so in this case rather we, we don't have a significant uh, uh, need to that effect here. This is an opportunity to collaborate regionally, which makes more sense financially and otherwise. But I'll let Mr. Parker speak. Uh, th thank you, Drew. Th that is correct. So the county's taking a lead in preparing the study. They're simply asking for the various cities in the county to contribute, since this is something, as uh, Mr. Powers mentioned, every city in the county is going through as part of their housing element update. Updating this particular study was actually one of the comments we received from the state when we submitted the housing element approved by council. So by moving forward with this item, it actually satisfies one of the programs that we're looking to include in our housing element. But in terms of outreach and running the study and the methodology, that will be handled by the county. Thank you. And with that, I move to approve item 7F. Very good, Madam Clerk. Councilmember Bill Delapena? Yes. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. And Mayor Engler? Yes. And that motion carries 4 0 with Mayor Pro Tem Jones absent. And Mayor, I do have three ordinance titles to read into the record. Go ahead. An ordinance adopting specific plan 23 1 Baxter Way and its associated general plan amendment and authorizing the land uses and development standards in said specific plan applicant 1 Baxter Way LP and that's ordinance number 1701 NS and an ordinance approving a development agreement 1 Baxter Way applicant 1 Baxter Way LP ordinance number 1702 NS and an ordinance amending Thousand Oaks Municipal Code Title V, Chapter 29, Section 5-29.01, 5-29.05, 5-29.08A, 5-29.11, 5-29.12A, 5-29.14, 5-29.18B, 5-29.24, 5-29.27D, 5-29.31C, 5-29.32E, 5-29.34A1, 5-29.34A2, 5-29.3483, and 5-29.34A6, 5-29.36H, and 5-29.37C regarding allowing adult use retail of cannabis and updated language to meet current standards and amending Title IX, Chapter 4, Sections 9-4.202 and 9-4.2105 to include cannabis retailer as a permitted use in the M1 zone, MCA 2022-70430, and that's an ordinance number 1703 NS. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit out of order like I mentioned before. Uh, we are gonna jump down to um, the Item 11A, which is our commission's report. So um, first up, we're going to have a Council on Aging annual report. Good evening, Mayor Engler and Council members. My name is Rosanna Guerra. I am the chair of the Council on Aging, and it is my pleasure to be here this evening to present the 2021-22 the Council on Aging Annual Report. We had a challenging and exciting year. In addition to the ongoing adjustments to the COVID pandemic health requirements, the Council on Aging welcomed a new staff liaison, Sarah Mayles. 
and we transitioned to an updated resolution. Ultimately, we have been resilient and never canceled a meeting or an event. Our monthly meetings are an opportunity to build and deepen relationships, as well as to learn about projects and provide feedback from an older adult perspective. As you see on the screen, we had a range of knowledgeable guest speakers. Topics included everything from the Climate and Environmental Action Plan to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Throughout the year, commissioners sought to be engaged in the community and make a difference. There are two activities we'd like to highlight. First is the Lifelong Learning Series. This was a three-way partnership. The Council on Aging sponsored the series, the library staff taught the classes, and the Global Adult Center provided the classroom. The series encouraged resources available for free from the library. And the older adults were encouraged to bring their tablet or smart device for hands-on learning. The classes included how to use Libby, Get Set Up, North Star Digital Literacy, and Skillshare. The series was very informative for all who attended. The other activity we'd like to highlight is the 2022 Wellness Festival. Planning this activity in the midst of COVID was really challenging, but, we, but by moving the festival outside to the parking lot at the Global Adult Community Center, we were able to have a wonderful event. The Wellness Festival took place on January 19, 2022, and had over 400 participants. The Council on Aging hosted a booth to hand out swag and, pro and provide information. The Wellness Festival is a key event to connect older adults to much needed resources. I would like to introduce Vice Chair Stephanie Belding to provide the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Rosanna. Good evening, Mayor Engler and City Council. My name is Stephanie Belding. I have been on the Council on Aging for four years. Commissioners deepened relationships across the community, as well as provided updates and information with organizations through serving as a liaison. The liaison positions are listed on the screen and included a whole range of organizations, a wide range of organizations, addressing older adult issues throughout the community. A summary of each commissioner's experience is included as attachment one to the staff report. As you may recall, the Council on Aging conducted a survey of older adults between January 15 and April 1st of 2021. The survey findings and recommendations were presented to City Council on October 26, 2021. To provide the information to the community, we composed a letter and sent the results to eight organizations within the community who serve older adults and would benefit from the information. In March and April 2022, we presented the survey findings and recommendations to two organizations, Senior Concerns and the Global Adult Community Center Commission. The information sparked important conversation for how to better serve older adults in the community. Specifically, senior concerns brought up two important issues that we would like to highlight. Number one, older adults are at greater risk for homelessness due to rising costs of rent. And number two, transportation for older adults to get to and from adult daycare. In an effort to facilitate ongoing dialogue and better understand current trends, the Council on Aging added a liaison position with senior concerns, and that started in June and will continue as we move forward. In 2023, the Council on Aging will seek direction from the city manager's office on potential projects, such as working to update and repeat the older adult survey or other activities that support our duties. I will now hand it back to Rosanna to conclude our presentation. As we conclude our presentation, we wanna thank you again for having us tonight. And we would like to thank, um, and we'd like to see if you had any um, questions for us. Our community services analyst, 
Sarah Bales, Vice Chair um, Stephanie Belding, and I are available. Thank you very much. Questions from my colleagues? <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. McNamee. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to acknowledge and say thank you so much for the service that you've done in this community for these seniors. It's so good to get the feedback from your commi committee as to how we move forward with meeting those needs, and I thank you very much for your service. Mayor? Thank you. Ms. Bill de la Pena. Thank you. I didn't have any questions, but I just have a comment to make. Thank you so much for your work. You're both and the entire group so very dedicated and trying to make life better for the uh, older residents of Thousand Oaks. Very, very much appreciated and thank you for, for um, uh, bringing forth new ideas and some of the events that, that you have done and organized. It's, it's just very helpful. Thank you. Thank you for your support. And I also echo, echo my um, colleagues here. Um, Mr. Adam, do you have something to say? Well, I appreciate you being there. I mean, our fastest growing demographic are seniors in the city. So uh, appreciate your representation and letting us know what seniors are thinking. It's invaluable as we make our decisions here at the council. Thank you. And I just wanted to add that we'll be moving our um, meeting location to the Global Adult Center so that we'll be um, better able to you know, meet the needs of our population. Sometimes it's a little difficult to get people to come directly to um, the Civic Center. So by being at the Global Adult, I think that we'll be able to really um, uh, capture that population a, a little bit more adequately. So thank you again for your support and your time. And thank you very much. And um, our partnership with the Parks and Rec is ev evident here. Our Global Center, which is our building, and it's administered by our Recreation and Parks District. It's a great organization, and I'm glad that you are part of it as well. Thank you. Next up, we do have our Youth Commission annual, annual report. So um, I see we have for representatives of our Youth Commission here, so please come on down and introduce yourselves to everybody. Good evening, Mayor Angler and Council Members. It is our pleasure to be here this evening to present the 2021-2022 Youth Commission Annual Report. My name is Catherine Shu, and it was an honor to serve as the Youth Commission Chair this past year. I'm a senior at Westlake High School, and this was my last year because I was a um, senior, so I will unfortunately not be on the commission next year. We had a challenging and exciting year, just like the Council on Aging. In addition to the ongoing adjustments to COVID um, and the requirements, the Youth Commission welcomed Sarah Miles, a new staff liaison, and we also transitioned to an updated resolution. Ultimately, we were very resilient, and all, we all came together to adjust to the health orders and never canceled a meeting or event. We, also, during our monthly meetings, we had knowledgeable guest speakers that provided the commission opportunities to build relationships, as well as review and provide input on matters pertaining to youth. I felt like these guest speakers were really insightful because youth asked so many questions and learned so much about topics like city transit and communications and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I hope that we can continue to have conversations and um, bring ideas that we we develop from these conversations to, um, to the city. Youth commissioners also deepened relationships across the community and provided updates and information with organizations through serving as a liaison to the City of Thousand Oaks Library and the Alex Fiore Teen Center. I would like to introduce Commissioner Jacqueline Emanuel to talk more about the Youth Leadership Summit that we hosted this past year. Good evening, Mayor Engel and City Council. My name is Jacqueline Emanuel, and I have been on the commission for five years and served as the Youth Leadership Summit Planning Co-Chair for the 2022 Biennial Youth Leadership Summit that was held on March 30th in the Kavli Theater Founders Room. The event brought together 22 leaders and over 60 youth from the city of Thousand Oaks, and the summit was successful in providing youth an opportunity to engage with local leaders and to learn from their leadership, as well as to share in concerns and ideas. 
Uh, the program included leader roundtables, youth only roundtables, and a keynote address. There are many important conversations that took place and many positive outcomes um, that will help shape the direction of the Youth Commission for the upcoming year. I would like to introduce Vice Chair Riley Goodnight. Good evening, once again, Mayor Engler and City Council. My name is Riley Goodnight and I have been on the Commission for five years now. For the leadership roundtable discussions, two community leaders were assigned to each table and every 20 minutes, the youth rotated to provide students the opportunity to meet and dialogue with a minimum of six leaders. Leaders were provided table topics to use for conversation starters and to help facilitate the discussion. Leaders were also invited to stay for dinner and the keynote speaker, Amy Commons of Los Robles Health System. The evening ended with a youth only discussion facilitated by a youth commissioner or other youth table facilitators. And throughout the summit, the main topics of discussion held included mental and behavioral health, community involvement, diversity, equity, and inclusion, environment and sustainability, academic and study supports, and transportation for youth in the city. I would like to introduce Commissioner Camille Alasky. Good evening, Mayor Engler and City Council. My name is Camille Alasky, and I have been on the commission for two years. We encouraged every youth and community leader to complete an event evaluation. The responses were overwhelmingly positive. We have selected a handful of participant quotes to summarize the experience. The youth said, the summit helped me realize many problems in my community and how I can help. It also made the government feel more hands-on and another person said that it gave me faith in the process and change that our generation is making. The community leaders reported, my favorite part of the summit was the interaction with the youth and hearing their questions and concerns. Another community leader also mentioned that there is a need to continue pushing out information about how youth can get involved in their city and school district and how their involvement can make a difference. Additional information can be found in the summit report attached to the staff report. We would like to thank staff from the Caneo Valley Unified School District, Caneo Youth Employment, Caneo Recreation and Park District, the city, and volunteers for assisting us this term, especially our adult liaisons, Sarah Dobb and Leanne Petras. Additionally, we appreciate everyone who helped make the Youth Summit a success, including all 22 community leaders, Amy Commons as the keynote speaker, and the over 60 youth who attended. This concludes our presentation this evening and community services analyst Sarah Miles and we are available for your questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. Colleagues, questions, comments? Go ahead, Ms. Pilda Lepena. I really don't have any questions. Um, I, I just wanted to, all of you are seniors, right? All of you are leaving and I hope uh, you, you are leaving, well, I, I know you're leaving the commission in good hands, and I hope that the, the ones that are taking over now, the next uh, um, um, members stepping up, are, are going to uh, do just as great a job as you have done. And uh, Catherine, congratulations to completing your year on the um, school board as a representative of the student body. It, it was not easy. For you, it was pretty tough, and um, but but you are resilient, as are all the other students in our school district, and uh, thank you so much for standing up for what's right and for representing everybody in the school district and for and for fighting what you believe in. Appreciate that uh, not only from you but all the others here tonight and those who are serving on the commission. Thank you very much and good luck wherever you're going. Um, I know you will do well. Congratulations. Thank you. Mr. McNamee. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to extend my thanks for your participation in this. The report is very, very important for us as city council members to better address the needs of our youth in our community, which are you are future leaders. And by you stepping up and making that part of your day to provide that information is so very valuable. I look forward to hearing more about your good work you do after college and what you do in our community. Thank you so very much. Mr. Adam. Thank you, Mayor. Well, um, a couple of you said you've been on the commission for five years, is that right? Well, that's a, that's a pretty big time commitment. 
Um, and now you're all getting ready to go to college, right? Okay. Um, I'm just curious, because I've had some experience with the Youth Commission in the past, do you feel that the commission offers you opportunities to prepare for college and high, higher education? Do you think it, it gives you a, 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 a runway that maybe accelerates you and how you might do in college? Yeah, I think this is a really good and relevant question. I think that participating on the commission definitely allows us to be civically engaged, and that's not something that all youth have the ability to, to do. Um, so I definitely think that we have exposure to local city government and the different like roles that we play in the community, and I think that's very, very valuable. I do think that because we are such like a limited group, and that there are there is like an application process and an interview process. I would like to see more youth be civically engaged and have the opportunities to um, like learn about like community and um, and government and everything like that. Does, do you all have anything else? To add? I similarly agree with Catherine. I believe like the Youth Commission allowed me to connect with similarly motivated people. So it was like, oh, you're doing this to prepare for college? Oh, maybe I should do that or explore something related to that. And I feel like the Youth Commission also opened me up to meeting all sorts of like adults and other people in the community so I could gain their influence and like understand, okay, what's being an adult like and how should I prepare for that? And similarly to what Catherine said, I, we are like such a limited group. I almost wish that like everybody could try this because yeah. of what a great experience it was. But I think civic involvement for the youth is definitely beneficial, especially going into college and learning how to handle ourselves and connect with adults and not just like with people our own age is really a great experience. So thank you. Uh, I really appreciate hearing that uh, because I like to think that the Youth Commission, you do a lot of good work for your fellow students, but I like to think that it's a, it's a benefit for you, each of you personally. And when you say to me it promotes civic engagement, I think that that's very important because, uh, you know, frankly, some of our young people uh, takes them a while to get, you know, warmed up to civic engagement and to vote, and it sounds like you're, you're ahead of the game on that, so. Great comments, thank you. And so, wait, I get a chance to talk too. Um, just, uh, and thank you for your five years, some of you five years, so you came in as eighth graders all the way through high school, so that's a, that's a commitment, and really I, I hope that it was something that you were able to learn a lot from. I think my, my question is, um, I have the feeling that the youth leadership um, event was perhaps your favorite event that you did this year. Is there anything else that fell short or something that uh, we could have helped you with? Um, I think that our commission went in a new direction this year, in past years at least, um, the year, years that we've been on it. Um, we did more than just the Youth Leadership Summit as our event, but this year we tried to take more of a liaison role. Um, I will say I think that one of the events that the Youth Commission put on that I personally missed this year was the Youth Recognition Awards. I think that was, a, I don't, so I think that was a really important event in the community because it acknowledged all the service that youth in the community do. And I think that it's important to acknowledge them so that they'll be encouraged to continue to do so and they feel like they've been recognized. So I personally think that that was the area that was most lacking this year. But um, I think the direction that the commission is taking is a really important one. I'll also add something to that. I definitely think that the transition this year with the new resolution was difficult. It was really difficult because we've been so used to like planning events like the therapeutic dance and the um, youth recognition awards. But I do think that like recognizing um, the needs of the community and the needs of the youth was really important and kind of changing our direction was important. Um, I do think that we definitely need some more support in transitioning into a more advisory role, which is the purpose of the resolution. So um, I think that instead of us planning events like the Youth Recognition Awards, encouraging the city to have some sort of program that 
plans the youth recognition awards for like celebrating like youth's service to the community. So it's not like youth commissioners doing the work. So the program is still there, but our role as a commission has like kind of changed. Um, and then I also think that some of the programs like the city internship were very valuable, but again, with our new direction, it wouldn't be us specifically pl planning it and it would be more of us supporting a program like that. Um, but I do think that it was such a loss for to not host these events. So I, def I hope to see it in the future come up in some other place and the Youth Commission to have another role in it. Thank you for your input. Very good. Oh, I'm oh. sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, just kind of like echoing what um, Commissioner Emanuel and Shu said, um, I believe that for, especially like for people like me, Catherine and Jacqueline, we were on this commission for quite a long time. So when it randomly just, well not randomly, it was planned, but when it just switches to something new, it takes a little bit to like adjust to it. And I think um, with the new circumstances that we were put under, I think we did a pretty good job. However, it definitely was an adjustment. So I like the direction that's going, but I feel like that was definitely our biggest struggle this year, considering the fact that um, most of us were not used to doing this sort of thing. But I think the future Youth Commission members can all get it through now that they're starting off from this point. Okay, very good. Thank you for the input and thank you for the report. Well done. Oh. So, so, uh, Mayor, so, uh, so well spoken, these young people, aren't they? Our future leaders of America right here. So when you're done college, come back here to Thousand Oaks, okay? <laughs> but that's what I was saying earlier. The, uh, if you just want to feel good about your future, Look at kids like this, and uh, you will have no doubt how well we're going to do coming, going forward. Proud of all of you. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, that's our two presentations. So let's get back on the agenda. Um, we're going to go now to department reports. First up on our department reports is our Thousand Oaks Alliance for the Arts Operation and Programming Update. So um, please take it away. Mr. Mead. Good evening, uh, Mayor Engler and City Council members. On behalf of TO Arts, I'm here to present our six month report covering the last six months ending uh, June 30th, 2022. Um, we have some slides for you, and tonight I'll be giving you a brief overview of some of the highlights uh, contained in the report that you've received. Um, just this past May, we celebrated five years of TO Arts existence. Uh, I must say those five years flew by way too fast because um, I remember all the stuff. Uh, Patrick remembers that we went through to, to get where we were. Um, the ad hoc nominating committee of the board is currently undergoing a blue ribbon committee process where we've invited members of the community to a 90 minute session to uh, provide uh, input about TO Arts, learn about TO Arts and understand it. Um, and with that, uh, we're asking them to um, provide us with some names of potential individuals who um, could serve on the board because we're right now a board of eight and we're looking to expand uh, by one to two more people um, by year's end. Um, as I think I mentioned uh, in my last report in I believe January, we uh, started uh, uh, diverse, uh, the diversity, um, equity, um, um, training and, and, and information to, to formulate a plan for that. And we contracted with Ex Equity Praxis Group uh, to facilitate a strategic plan for us, um, a, a planning retreat uh, to discuss goals and objectives for the next three years and to develop an action plan uh, for the next two years. And they helped us uh, to weave the uh, DEI into that strategic plan. Um, with regard to finance, one of the most obviously important things of, uh, of everything to, to move forward, uh, we reviewed and accepted our an annual independent audit report for fiscal year 2020-2021 at our meeting on May 12th this last uh, month or two months ago. And it provides a written opinion of the auditor regarding our uh, financial statements from July 1st, 2020 
uh, to June 30th, 2021. And then next week at our board meeting, we'll be discussing our operating budget for the fiscal year 2022-2023. Next, uh, on the development side, we hosted our uh, gratitude reception in May uh, in person here in the Shear Forum, and we successfully surprised John Bradley and honored him with the Lifetime Heart for the Arts Award. And uh, thank you, Mayor Engler, uh, for making an appearance in the video to honor John. Um, and I believe, uh, Claudia, you were here, and we thank you for your attendance, too. If I missed anyone else, sorry, but <laughs> those are the ones I remember. Um, we're obviously grateful for the continuing uh, generosity of our donors, and we've uh, been receiving recurring gifts, both monthly and annually, um, and these membership groups continue to grow for us. And the roster of, these, of the membership group uh, uh, you know, obviously provides vital sustaining dollars to allow us uh, to fulfill our goals here. Um, this Ma May, after mm -hmm. nearly three years, we were able to host our uh, annual Producers Club fang fundraising luncheon. I think we had well over 100 people in attendance, maybe 150, um, and we raised over 170,000 in donations. So it, it was good to, good to see everyone there and also uh, to, to raise a substantial amount of money. Uh, we continue to be a sponsor of Cal Lutheran's University Centers for Nonprofit profit leadership celebration of the sector event each year um, and then new this year we joined the greater Caneo Valley Chambers chairman circle and we were a sponsor of the state of the city address last December as well as the chamber recognition gala this May um, next slide thank you um, programs access arts um, this is a uh, very um, important to us. It uh, is a program that supports elementary schools to provide high quality sequential arts edu education to students throughout Ventura County. Uh, this past year, we provided over 60,000 in grant funding to seven local ele elementary schools. In one school, we funded the construction of a dance studio. In another, it was artists in the classroom uh, residencies. In a, in a third, it was weekly dance lessons. And yet in another, it was art supplies and so on. Additionally, TO Arts was invited to be a partner with the Caneo School Foundation and Caneo Valley Unified School District in the creation of a five-year strategic arts master plan for the entire CVUSD K-12 student population. Um, next thing, virtual field trips. Um, as you know, obviously due to the pandemic, uh, can't bring them here, so what have we done? We brought the um, field trip uh, virtually to them. And we've had five to 700 students each month experience uh, the field trip. Um, basically, the video content was made available through agreements with different diverse artists across the country. And these uh, specifically curated videos were available for one month at a time and can be viewed directly through our website, uh, www.toarts.org. This year, we tried to focus on aligning with curriculum being taught in schools. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, we had Martin's Dream during January uh, regarding Martin Luther King. Um, we also had Jazzy Ash during February and so forth. Uh, teachers were very grateful for the opportunity to show arts programming during a year when they were specifically asked to focus on core subjects of Eng English language arts, math, and science. Uh, well over 7,000 students and teachers accessed this content during the 2021-2022 school year and they have requested that we keep this program alive for the 2022-2023 school year as well, and we intend to do so. Um, next, we've had our um, Olson performance grants. Um, as you know, uh, these grants uh, provide theater credits for entities pr performing here in the uh, Bank of America Performing Arts Center, and we were able to provide grants to our three resident companies as well as other local uh, non-performing arts groups. And this year we distributed $117,800, of which 80,000 went to the three resident companies. Um, additionally, the three resident companies received 1,000 each in social media marketing support uh, to promote their winter performances. Um, Next slide. Um, as you know, um, the city of Thousand Oaks um, um, instituted the emergency arts grants, and at the request of city of Thousand Oaks, TO Arts was um, happy to undertake the task of uh, reviewing the application or 
I don't know if it was application, but reviewing the grant funds and determining which entities uh, would receive those funds and how it would be broken out. We actually received 19 applications from the local community art pro nonprofits. And after reviewing those, we awarded the funding to 17 of those organizations and all $500,000 were distributed to uh, the entities, which obviously was severely needed by all of these groups. Um, also, um, the Young Artists Ensemble, um, as you may know, uh, the long-term agreement between the Arts Council of the Canal Valley and the Young Artists Ensemble program uh, administered by the Canal Recreation Parks District came to an end. And in the interim, TO Arts has agreed to serve as a fiscal receiver for that program. As you, um, well, the YAE is a fixture in the local community and provides local youth and teens between the ages of 10 and 19 with opportunities to perform in plays and musicals, and we're happy to help them out so they can continue doing so. Um, next, uh, our TO Arts Presents. Uh, as you know, that's the uh, presenting portion of uh, TO Arts for performances here um, in the Cavity Theater and the Share Forum. And we're obviously the largest presenter um, here at the Bank of America Performing Arts Center. And um, this past year, uh, we took a very aggressive approach to programming to promote a strong, safe reopening of the arts and entertainment sector. This year, we presented 51 performances between the two theaters. We attracted more than 45,000 patrons and generated approximately $2.19 million. Um, here's a little of what we have upcoming. Uh, first, uh, uh, for the second year, we're going to have our TO Arts After Dark at Stagecoach, which will be in September and October. And um, I highly recommend uh, anyone and everyone to come out and see those shows. They're great. They're great. And uh, the environment out there is, is perfect for a, a nighttime show. Um, for this next year, for um, the two theaters, we so far have 40 confirmed shows. And... Uh, Jonathan and his team are continuing to add more performances throughout the year. Um, we are planning for our Kids in the Arts program to restart in February 2023. And through this, we expect to bring around 5,000 students to the theater uh, before the close of the next school year. Um, and next, for um, just a little um, information on some performances coming up, uh, Kobe Callier returns home to uh, Thousand Oaks in August. Um, Elvis Costello and uh, Weird Al Yankovic will be joining us as well coming up um, on September 20th. Uh, the War and Treaty will be performing here in the Shear Forum and uh, tickets go on sale next week, plug, plug. And uh, we are excited about our lineup of upcoming performances and look forward to sharing many more exciting shows um, once our programming brochure comes out later this month. So on behalf of TO Arts, their board, um, the staff, the millions of patrons who's, who've attended shows here uh, throughout the many years we've been in existence, um, we thank you, the city of Thousand Oaks, and the council for your continued support of our efforts and activities and the arts. Uh, um, the world cannot survive without arts. Um, so this completes the report. Um, Executive Director Jonathan Surratt, Associate Director Nikki Richardson and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Mead. Questions from my colleagues? No, no questions. Comments, very good. Comment from <laughs> Ms. Bill de la Pena. Thank you. Um, I didn't know about YAE that there was this fiscal receivership situation, so um, that was news to me tonight. Yes. Is that going okay so far? Um, so far, so good, yeah. We've si signed off on the agreement and no issues, right, Jonathan? Correct. We, we do have an executed agreement in place that we've only uh, entered into within the last month and a half or so. Uh, but we are moving forward, and it's a, a trial for about a year, so we have an interim agreement uh, to see how the relationship works between YAE and TO Arts, but also give them some cushion of time so that they can properly vet and evaluate if there's another direction that they would like to take with another fiscal receiver or perhaps another nonprofit. Thank you. I guess I did have a question, but I know I'm going <laughs> to have a comment. 
Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it is incredible what uh, TO Arts has done over the last uh, five years or so, and especially since you started the, uh, the pop-up uh, weekends in June that I attended several of them. They were all very well attended. The community just loves free concerts, even light opera at um, Parque de la Paz in, in here in Central Thousand Oaks. I mean, music is a big draw. Performance is just a big draw, especially when it's free. So that is really my one of my favorite things. And I, I appreciate that, and I hope we will be able to continue that um, because it's, it's wonderful. And uh, just thank you so much. Yeah, and I, I do have to say um, for the pop-up that that's actually a... Um, Cultural Affairs Department, uh, oh. City of Thousand Oaks uh, events, oh. but TO Arts does sponsor one of the um, pop-up uh, uh, nights. But that's that's kudos to the department. Uh, they 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 um, do all that with the obviously the the city with the City of Thousand Oaks. Uh, funding. Good. I mean, everywhere I go, I do see the TO Arts banner or sign. So uh, it's 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 all married together. It is. It We're is. all it's one a, big artistic family. So thank you so much. It's great that uh, you're able to do as much as as you are and doing so successfully. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah. Th thank you, and thank you, uh, Claudia, for your support of the arts. And uh, just take the credit. This is uh, TO Arts, it's pop ups, right? Come on, just take the credit. Um, I, I really enjoy how TO Arts and, and our cultural department uh, work hand in glove. So it, it's really good to see that. Um, I'm curious as we come out of uh, our, our COVID, um, are you able to get out more and more? And I know you've made some progress there. Are you looking forward to a better year next year? Uh, you know, I, I think uh, it can only go up from where we've been. I mean, we had a great last year, but uh, um, um, we, we, we made a, a, a profit, but uh, it's not as much, obviously, as in years past. But so it can only improve from there. And I think it, it's going to. I think the world is starting to, to open up. Uh, and uh, I think uh, people are going to get more involved with the arts uh, as they feel more comfortable as time progresses. Thank you again for the report, and thanks to our, our cultural affairs people, to um, the good job and good partnership. Thank you for that. Great. Thank you very much. Next up, we do have another uh, department report and um, uh, staff report. So um, this has to do with the Conejo Canyon Bridge at Hill Canyon Treatment Plant. Uh, this has to do with the contract for building a bridge in that area, and I'll turn it over to our uh, public works. Nader Hadari is our going to do our presentation tonight. Uh, we also have Tracy Friedel here. When you're ready. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and good evening, Council Members. Uh, my name is Nader Hidari. Joining me tonight is Tracy Friedel, uh, the Assistant City Attorney from the City Attorney's Office, Anna Huber from Casca, and also Ida Feruzan from the Public Works Department as our lead engineer on the project. Uh, the project is located on the west side of Hill Canyon Road, approximately two miles south of Santa Rosa Road, which, and it is spanning across the Arroyo Caneo Creek, adjacent to Hill Canyon Treatment Plant. Uh, just providing a little more details as a closer look of the proposed improvements. And the uh, proposed bridge is in yellow on this slide, on the uh, left-hand side, and then it will be supplemented by a 375-foot-long access road uh, that will connect the bridge to Hill Canyon Road. The project will also include bridge abutments and utilities, as well as habitat restoration. I um, just wanted to start with some project background to illustrate the effort that has gone into uh, bringing the project to where it is today. Staff from the Public Works Department and COSCA began the, process, the design process in late 2018, which was a process that spanned a couple of years due to extended time frame to obtain the environmental permits and clearances from some of the regulatory agencies, including California Department of Fish and Wildlife, amongst others. These environmental clearances and permits were challenging due to the bridge's environmentally sensitive location adjacent to the creek. Staff completed the engineering and design work of the project in early 2022, and City Council adopted the MND and authorized the project to go out to bid 
in March. Uh, as I mentioned, the project has had a strong collaboration across departments and even across agencies. This bridge was identified in Costca's Caneo Canyons Management Plan as a high priority location um, for improving public access and it's a key component of the Caneo Canyons open space. It will connect existing trails on both sides of the creek and it's an important link between the Caneo Canyons and Wildwood Park. Construction of the bridge will help improve access to Wildwood from the Santa Rosa Valley. Here are some just conceptual images of what the 12 foot wide, 140 foot long steel truss bridge spanning the creek will look like. It's going to be uh, matched in the overall appearance with the other adjacent bridge that was built approximately 10 years ago further up Hill Canyon Road next to the public trail parking lot. Um, this is just another image of the engineering plans. Um, the bridge is going to not only connect existing hiking trails, but it will also be used by pedestrians and equestrians and it will provide access for city maintenance vehicles between two of the city's most critical uh, facilities, which is the Hill Canyon Treatment Plant and the Municipal Service Center. Um, the bridge will also provide a, a secondary emergency egress from Hill Canyon Treatment Plant and it is being engineered to be HL93 loaded, which means it can accommodate heavy vehicles and uh, some of the lighter fire access uh, equipment if necessary. As mentioned, the project went out to bids earlier this spring and we had a strong showing with a total of seven bids submitted on June 8th. The lowest bid was from United Construction and Landscape in the amount of 1.9 million. However, United's bid was deemed non-responsive on June 14th as a result of their failure to properly complete the information in bid form six and the bid package, which required all bidders to list at least three projects that have been completed in the last five years of similar scope and complexity. Therefore, Beater Construction Company is the lowest responsible bidder with their bid of $2.1 million. The bid package for Beater has been reviewed and found to be in order. The project costs um, suffered some of the same challenges that other uh, projects are being um, encountering these days, such as you know, material supply increases and labor increases and overall tight construction market. In addition, some of the final requirements and the environmental permits added some scope to the project for the construction contractor. Our Assistant City Attorney Tracy Friedel will now touch on some of the, uh, some additional information on the topic of responsive bids. Good evening. So one of the recommendations you're um, uh, asked to do tonight is to reject the bid protest appeal by United Construction and to find their bid is non-responsive. Um, <clears throat> so just a brief shallow dive into the public contract code. A responsive bid is one which conforms to the material terms of the bid package that was issued by the city, which means did it answer the questions we asked and provide the information that we asked for? Um, the city has the discretion to determine whether a bid is responsive or not. And uh, we do also have the discretion to require literal compliance with the bid package and the specifications. And in determining responsiveness, we are looking solely at the contents of the bid itself without investigation of outside information. So any additional information that is um, or was provided by a, a non-responsive bidder must relate directly to whether or not they were responsive. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, here are some of the details of the timeline of this uh, bid protest. As I mentioned, staff deemed United's bid as non-responsive on June 14th. A bid protest was filed by United on June 15th, requesting the city reconsider that their bid. On June 16th, the Public Works Director, under delegated authority from city manager, rejected United's bid proposal um, based on, again, the, uh, the lack of supplementary information. And on June 21st, the city clerk received the appeal from United. In summary, and as listed in the staff report, United's appeal and protests have failed to provide the documentation and references necessary to overcome the finding of non-responsiveness. They did not list the required projects of similar scope in bid form six, 
including the main portion of the work, which is the installation of a steel bridge. Here's the breakdown of the total project costs for the upcoming construction phase, including support services, city furnish, and contingency, and some of the future habitat restoration work. The staff report includes a recommendation for additional funding as well. And the project schedule is before you here. Uh, with your approval tonight, staff will move the project into the construction phase with a target completion by next spring, followed by site and habitat restoration. There are some uh, critical timelines that have to be met in order to uh, construct the improvements outside of bird nesting season and, and, and some other factors, and which have been incorporated into the schedule. I want to uh, close with a recap of the project benefits and features and how they meet the original project goals that provide trail and vehicular access across the creek, provide a defined route between the Santa Rosa Equestrian Park and Wildwood Canyon for trail users, including pedestrians, bicycles, and equestrians, accommodating Costco Rangers access uh, for maintenance and open space management to improve that even further, and provide emergency vehicular access out of Hill Canyon for wildfire purposes, which we have actually experienced uh, during the Hill Fire in 2018. And lastly, uh, provide a direct and safer crossing for some vehicles between two of the uh, critical facilities at uh, the City of Thousand Oaks. The recommendations are listed in the staff report, and the staff uh, from various departments are here to available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you, Mayor. Mr. McNamee. I have a question. Again, this just comes down to logistics. A company who has capable engineering equipment and staff and expertise, what I'm hearing is that their bid is being rejected simply because they did not provide proof of similar projects over the last number of years. How does a company that is trying to either get into building such projects, get them under their belt in order to meet that hurdle, I assume this is typical of cities, it's sort of like saying you can apply for this job but we're looking for experience, but you can't get the experience because you've never gotten the job before. How do, how do we do this? I understand we want to protect the project to make sure it can go to completion, but how do you get into the industry if you can't even get a chance at showing what you can do? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I can't speak for other agencies, but I know that all, we have not limited the scope of the similar projects to other public agency or public projects. There are several land development projects that use uh, bridges. There are several, uh, you know, park districts and other agencies, and so even you know, private properties that can, uh, as they're being developed, as we see these days, the the properties that are remaining to be developed typically have you know other you know terrain challenges. So. Uh, we did not require that you know the projects be only of, of from pub other public agencies, but that's a challenge for any business uh, trying to expand into other areas. And um, but well, I hope that that addresses your question. Y yes, yes, it does. It's sort of a catch-22, and that's a, that's a challenge for any business trying to get in their foot in the door with uh, municipal business. Uh, the other question I have is why did it take so long to get through the state of California for approval in this project? What were the delays? What happened? Yeah, as, uh, as mentioned, most of those delays were on the review process for obtaining the environmental permits, the uh, mapping out the conditions for those permits, uh, revising the design to accommodate the comments from those agencies that uh, those agencies are responsible for some of the, uh, the, the, the wildlife and terrain and um, waterways through the area. So um, we had anticipated some level of protracted uh, time frame for some of those uh, permitting processes, but it, you know it, it did go beyond that. Once this project is completed, my desire is that it is ta uh, relieves the traffic, parking, noise, pollution, dust burden that exists with the Wildwood Park entrance off of Avenue de los Arbolos to shift the regional park. Uh, traffic that's coming into that small parking lot that spills over into the neighborhood, disrupting the quality of life that they have, a quality of life that has shifted because celebrities have gone into that park and talked about what a wonderful waterfall that's year-round, resulting in people from all over the Southland coming to that park and being a burden on that community. What are we doing as a city once it's in in 2023 to try to shift it to this new location at the Hill Canyon plant 
away from Avenue de los Herbalis parking lot there at Wildwood Park. Yeah, th that's certainly been a topic of the conversation and I think this, this bridge will be one of the final pieces that will allow that other access point to become more official and more you know, publicized and so forth and perhaps the uh, Costco can add any additional commentary to that if, th if they have any. Good evening, Councilmember McNamee. Thanks for your question. Um, the primary thing that we'll be doing is changing the address so that when a, and whenever a potential visitor Googles Wildwood Park, for example, the address that they will encounter will be um, on Hill Canyon Road. Well, that's a, a nice start. Uh, I'm looking at people who've used it now for the past five, seven years, and they're not Googling anymore because they know how to get there and these would not be local residents, one of the suggestions I made was that we have two park rangers there who open it up in the morning, and you show ID if you are a Thousand Oaks resident, you park for free. If you're not, $20, and here's a piece of paper showing you where you can park for free at the Hill Canyon uh, parking location. So the residents tell me there's about 1,000 cars per weekend. I sat there one day, and their count is about right. They're disruption of their life with dust, noise, barbecue, uh, fumes from the cars early in the morning before it opens up are very accurate, so they're not exaggerating. And I'm looking to see how we can change their behavior of those who already know the location to look at that as a possibility that if you're a Thousand Oaks residents, your taxpayers' dollars goes to your free parking here. If you're not, $20, and here's a sheet where you can go park for free if you don't want to uh, park here at this location for $20. Is that something that you can look at as a possibility here? We can definitely look at that. I'm talking $20,000 a weekend. That's pretty good money. I'm sure you could do something well with it. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, th thank you. I, I do live in the area, and I know uh, there are some folks who have, have problems. Other folks don't have a problem with it, but um, anything we do to help the neighbors over there be well, well uh, appreciated. Ms. Builder Le Pena. Well, I, th I thought you had a comment. Mr. Adam. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I mean, this really is an important project because as Councilmember McNamee says, it should hopefully take some of the pressure off that uh, parking lot. The, the only access to Wildwood, which is an extremely popular park, it's gotta be the most popular one in the city because that waterfall down there is really uh, beautiful to hike down to. Um, so uh, looking forward to that helping the neighborhood. Um, on the, as far as the cost, so we're gonna take a bit of 2.1 million, but by the time you add in all the ancillary costs associated with it, we're up to 3.2. So, okay, I get that. But it also says here that we'll get a uh, donation from Caneo Open Space Foundation, uh, donation from Caneo Rec and Park, and Costco is going to pursue a funding opportunity up to a couple hundred thousand. Is that likely that we're going to get that? Um, the first two elements, I believe the answer is yes. The additional grant funding that's being pursued, that's, that's an active process right now. So, okay. Um, that yeah. Would be and uh, I think this is a, a regional park, really, in a sense. A lot of people from out of town come here. So I don't see any reason why the county can't participate in this in some way. Um, there, on here, there's a county permitting and inspection fee. So that might be a start. Maybe they'd waive that or perhaps they consider contributing because I, as I say, I mean, if there's a regional park in Thousand Oaks, this is it. So would you do that please? Talk to the county about participating in a financial sense with this project. You think that's reasonable? We can make every attempt, yes. <laughs> every <laughs> attempt. Well, county's got a lot more money than we do. So uh, it seems to me that uh, that would be a, an appropriate ask. Will do. Thanks, Nadi. Very good. Any other comments? Uh, quick question I have uh, on the, we, we are looking at the second place bidder. Um, I'm assuming that this bidder did have experience in building bridges and, and that heavy uh, construction. 
Yes, certainly. Yes, they, they do have, and they did offer and provide the requisite uh, similar projects of similar scope and complexity, including bridges that were three or four times lo larger and longer than this one. Yeah. Was that common across the board that all the other bidders did have the requisite uh, experience? Well, with seven bids, I, I'm not sure we scrutinized maybe like the, you know, the five, fifth and sixth and seventh low bid, but uh, generally all of them, uh, yes, they did have that. All, all the top bidders with yes. the exception of our number one uh, low bidder? Correct. Okay. And then uh, I'm most interested in this bridge. I mean, I, I hike that area all the time. Um, having that access is going to be nice for the, for hiking and everything else. But one of the main reasons, I think, is to have that um, se second means of egress out of the Hill Canyon. Um, what type of weight can this uh, this uh, bridge handle? You said it was a HL93. I'm not I'm not familiar with that term. It's basically uh, H20, which is the 20 you know 20 tons. It's, I don't know why they started calling it HL93. It's slightly different. It's slightly, you know, higher, higher level of engineering, but it allows a 40,000-pound uh, crossing is my, my understanding. So that's a pretty good size truck. Right, yes. That's a pretty good size truck. <laughs> so, good. That should help us with that egress out of there uh, so we don't get caught flat-footed like we did the, the, the last time Hill Canyon went off. Very good. Yeah. And yes, uh, Mr. Adam, we have put in for that grant um, last year. We were back there asking for it, and it seemed promising. We have a good good chance on it. Okay, um, we do not have uh, public comments on this item, so we could probably just jump down to any uh, council discussion on this since we have no public comments. Any other discussion, my colleagues? Very good. Let's um, let's go for a uh, yeah. Motion. I was going to move approval. Very good, Madam Clerk. We have a motion for approval. Councilmember Bill De La Pena. Yes. Councilmember Adam. Yes. Councilmember McNamee. Yes. And Mayor Angler. Yes. And that motion carries four zero with Mayor Pro Tem Jones absent. Very good. Our next our next item up is a uh, general plan amendment initiation. We have Stephen Kearns coming down. Anytime you're ready, Mr. Kearns, go ahead. Well, thank you, and good evening, Mayor Engler and members of the City Council. Uh, as mentioned before you this evening is a general plan amendment requested by Hospital Corporation of America to change the land use element from various cat uh, categories at two different locations uh, within the city. And there's two different locations, um, and I'll clarify why that is later in the presentation. Um, the, the second request is authorized concurrent processing of legislative actions and the project entitlements for the proposed project at Los Robos. Here's a, a process flow chart for your, your, um, for your consideration. The first step was a pre-application. The applicant has gone through that, and we've identified certain project changes we'd like to see. Um, as part of that pre-application, we identified that a general plan amendment is required, and that's where we're at tonight. Um, the point where we're at here today is initiation of that general plan amendment. If that initiation is not granted, then the project stops here, and we don't go further. Um, if it is initiated, the, sec the next step will be the applicant to file the formal applications. Uh, staff will provide, perform environmental analysis. I'll take that back to the Planning Commission for recommendation to City Council. 
Um, at this stage, this is not a project, so there's nothing for city council to consider except for the initiation at this point. Here's an aerial perspective of the subject site. As you can see, there's uh, remnants of a former development. It was the um, Young Set Club. Uh, it was a preschool. Um, Rolling Oaks is to the north. Los Padres Drive is to the west. Uh, there's a play area, so it's pretty much flat work, landscaping, um, and some fencing. And that's pretty much the extent of the remnant development on the site. Through the pre-application pre process, the applicant submitted a conceptual site plan. Uh, this is it overlaid onto an aerial photograph. Um, as shown, their proposed building size is about 60,000 square feet. They provide parking, fencing, landscaping, and some retaining walls. This is an aerial photograph with the adjacencies, the um, land use designations. There's commercial to the north, there's open space to the south, and residential to the east and west. Now this is the existing general plan land use designation. That's a very low residential, which has a maximum unit of two units per acre. Um, again, to the north is commercial, to the west is multifamily residential, and to the south is open space, east is also residential. Now the applicant is requesting to change the very low density residential to commercial. Um, it'd be serve as an extension of the commercial to the north, and so now it's it's yellow color, which is very low residential. They're looking to make it red, so it'll be similar to what's, or identical to what's north of them. So we go from here back down to red. Now part of why we're here, and I touched on it um, in, the, in the beginning, is uh, in order for an applicant to change a land use designation from residential to anything lower density, it requires offsetting that loss of residential somewhere else um, within the city limits. So in this case, the applicant has submitted two, uh, one general plan amendment for two locations. One is requesting change of the very low residential density to commercial. Uh, the second is requesting change of in, in, in institutional use to um, residential to offset that loss. Now the institutional site is located on the property at Las Robas Hospital. And of course the commercial site is over off, off Rolling Oaks. Now this is, uh, this is done to satisfy SB 330, um, which basically has a no net loss standard. So we can't lose residential density throughout the city. So it, it brings us to essentially a math formula. Um, you have 4.75 acres at the current site. The maximum density is two units per acre. That, uh, if you round down, it gets you to nine units per um, nine units for the site, and, we, and since we can't um, lose those units, we have to offset that at another location. So the applicant has identified um, a portion of the property at Las Robles Hospital. Um, it currently is institutional, and they're requesting to change that to low density resident, residential, which has a maximum density of 4.5 units per acre. The site is 2.15 acres, you multiply that by the 4.5 units, and it gets you to nine units when you round down. So this graphic is just to identify how this, uh, what's happening here. It's going from 400 Rolling Oaks Drive to 215 West Drive, uh, Jans Road. Um, so the density is actually being transferred, it's not being lost, and this satisfies the strict application of SB 330. And again, this is just to demonstrate the math. We have 4.75 acres uh, at Rolling Oaks, the times the density gets us to nine units, and the same with uh, the Jans Road site, which is 2.15 acres times the density gets us to nine units. This corner portion of the site here, this is the parking lot area at the Jans Hos uh, Las Robles Hospital at Jans Road. Um, this is the area that would be receiving the units. Uh, so it's actually just across the way from residential to the south and to the southwest. And that brings us to what would be the next steps if city council initiates the general plan amendment as well as a concurrent processing. The applicant will be required to submit the formal applications. 
Uh, those would be for a zone change, a lot merger, a development permit, and a tree permit. Uh, that would take us into the environmental review analysis uh, to determine which environmental document would be required. Um, back to Planning Commission review for recommendation to City Council, then back to you for a final decision. So the recommendation before you is to provide direction to staff, either to adopt a resolution initiating the general plan amendment and the concurrent processing, or deny the initiation, and that would stop the project or the process here tonight. Now again, um, I just want to emphasize that there's no project before you tonight. This is purely an initiation, so we can consider it and get, allow the applicant to pursue a project. And this concludes staff's presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Kearns. Questions from my colleagues? Ms. Bill de la Pena. Thank you, Mayor Engler. Uh, good evening. In, in looking at the two parcels, the, in an order to comply with SB 330, how realistic is it that these, uh, that the corner at Westlake, at uh, Lynn Road and Jance Road, can actually be used for residential units, nine in number? Say you still get a state density bonus. I mean, um, to have residential at, at that corner on, an, on a medical campus. I mean, SB 330 doesn't expire until 2030. So is it feasible that the land may just sit there until it expires before it can revert to institutional? That, that is a possibility. The applicant has not identified or discussed any contemplated project at that corner. Um, but if that pr the project site wanted to change again back to something other than residential, it'd have to find, they'd have to find another location to offset that loss again. So it's. Um, at that point, the, the applicant would have to just uh, continue to provide that residential somewhere else in the city. Okay, thanks. That's it. Very good. Any other questions? A uh, real quick question. This is very similar to what we did last week with the Baxter property, uh, kind of an unused parking lot area at the hospital site. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. There's a residential project going out in the corner of the Baxter site, um, very similar to uh, the site. Very good. Okay, we do have um, our applicant who is now up for um, making a presentation. Um, we have 15 minutes for our applicant to make a presentation. Um, I welcome to, uh, to, the, to our uh, humble esteem, uh, Natalie Moosey. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight. I'm Natalie Moosey, the CEO of Los Robles Health System. Los Robles has been serving the community since 1968. We have three inpatient hospitals and six outpatient clinics. The health system has been nationally recognized for our patient safety by the LeapFrog Group eight times in a row and is fully accredited by the Joint Commission. Los Robles is a level two trauma center, a STEMI designated heart attack center, and a comprehensive stroke center. The health system provides comprehensive women's and children's services and employs over 1,600 employees and has over 600 physicians practice, practicing over 50 different medical specialties in the community. Our vision at the hospital is to be the community's most trusted resource for health and a regional destination for care. Since 1981, Los Robles Health System's cancer program has been continuously accredited by the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer. Over the years, we have seen our cancer program grow with the addition of new services and offerings such as advanced treatments, patient navigation, genetic counseling, and state-of-the-art technology. One gap in our offering in the community is the ability to provide our cancer patients with an outpatient treatment destination. The proposed Los Robles Medical Office located next to Los Robles' Thousand Oaks Surgical Hospital, would provide patients with a concierge-like experience offering full-scope cancer treatment options. The patient education and enrichment services will also be available with nurse navigators guiding patients every step of the way. Other services would include nutrition, genetic counseling, and preventative care. The physical space will be designed with wellness in mind, offering open common spaces, a healing garden, as well as dedicated area for support groups and education. 
We are excited with the prospect to offer our cancer patients a comfortable, nurturing, and state-of-the-art facility with the community we have been serving since 1968. Being told that you have cancer is not a diagnosis that anyone expects to hear, but we hope having these comprehensive services in one location will make the journey to health just a little bit less daunting. As staff has explained, we've been working with the city to identify a receiving site to address SB 330. Given requirements of this new state bill, the best option was to identify the Jans property. We do not have any plans for this site, and the requested action is only to address the land use requirement. Any future development plans will need consideration of the hospital and its future operations and will be a thoughtful process working with the city and our community and would be subject to the city's review and applicable um, approvals. We're excited to further our vision and comprehensive health care services with the proposed medical office and look forward to working with the staff and the community to make this another valued asset in our services in Thousand Oaks. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We do not have any public speakers on this item, if I didn't mention that earlier. Um, any, any further questions? Madam de la Pena. Thank you. I, I do have a question, um, and perhaps Ms. Musi um, might be able to answer that. The, my question is about the, the land swap. So um, the, unlike the Baxter property, which is the building is 60% filled, I think, those Robles Hospital is bursting at the seams. Parking is an issue, as we know. So can you foresee a scenario where that corner at, at Lynn and Jantz can be converted into residential and uh, still solve the parking issues on this particular medical campus? Yeah, so at this time, as we discussed, we don't have any plans for the site. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'd kind of have to explore that with the city as we move forward. Okay. All right, thank you. Very good, I, I don't have any questions. All right. I would say we are up down to without any questions or discussion, motion? Motion, yeah. Um, I know it's very early in the process, but uh, the uh, proposed project looks very promising to me. Um, very compatible with Thousand Oaks Surgical Hospital right next door. And, uh, you know, this land swap is really to comply with the wisdom of Sacramento, who have again inserted themselves into our land use policies and require us to come up with this swap. So that's what we are doing. And I think uh, that's the first step to what may become a uh, very promising addition to the community. So with that, I will move. Uh, 10C, the general plan amendment that's been proposed by staff. Very good. Any discussion? Adam yes. Clark. Oh, I'm sorry. I Madam like Delgado how Pena. Mr. Adams said the wisdom of Sacramento. I sensed a level of sarcasm there. <laughs> uh, no, I will, I will support the motion. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Council Member Bill De La Pena. Yes. Council Member Adam. Yes. Council Member McNamee. Yes. And Mayor Angler. Yes. And that motion carries 4-0 with Mayor Pro Tem Jones absent. We're going down to our item D, which is our benefits and compensation for executive managers. Madam Clerk, do you need to read this at all or just go ahead? Very good. We do have... Um, for this item, we do have uh, Mr. Tim Giles, our Human Resources Director, uh, leading the, um, the discussion. Go ahead, Mr. Giles. Thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. I think I have the next four items for you, so we'll uh, try, and, try and move through these uh, expeditiously. Well, the first item is the benefits and compensation for executive managers. Uh, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, we are not proposing to change the benefits and compensation for executive managers, which the Council approved last year. The change that uh, to the resolution that's asked for in this time is to create an additional position, uh, an opportunity for an additional uh, position on the executive team uh, to assist uh, 
uh, the city manager in uh, managing uh, the organization and the uh, intricacies and complexities uh, that we are, are currently facing. And so this, uh, this change to add this new position for a, a director of uh, strategic communications uh, would, would allow uh, for that opportunity uh, to be done in the future. And with that, uh, there's a m minor budget impact with this. Uh, it is not, not a uh, new position. It would be reallocation of existing positions. Uh, and, and so therefore, there's only a minor budget impact. So staff would uh, request adoption of the resolution uh, and staff's available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Giles. We had a couple of quick puzzlement questions here, but um, Mr. McNamee. Mr. Giles, could you please elaborate a little bit more? Are we expanding the size of government by adding this position? No, this is, uh, this is an existing position. It is uh, allocating that position onto the executive team to allow them to function more effectively, uh, allowing the strategic communication component, which has become very vital uh, to our ability to successfully implement council direction, uh, to be able to communicate um, among the, the city staff, uh, to our partner agencies, uh, as well as to the public. It has become a, a critical function um, for us and to have somebody uh, performing that function who is a part of our executive team allows us to, to better serve the council's desires. Thank you. Any further questions? Ms. Bill de la Pena. Knowing how the city manager's office and the executives have been kind of running um, with, uh, you know, on bare bones, basically. It's been a bare bones organization. I would like to move item D, staff recommendation. D. Madam, Madam Clerk, item D. Council Member Bill De La Pena? Yes. Council Member Adam? Yes. Council Member McNamee? Yes. Mayor Engler? Yes. And that motion carries 4-0 with Mayor Pro Tem Jones absent. Our next item is item E, E. Edward. Yes, it uh, is, Mayor. It is now the retired annuitant. This is uh, exactly for a retired annuitant appointment. The Public Works Department is requesting some uh, expertise to assist them in an anticipated uh, rate case uh, being filed by uh, the Calam Water Company. Um, the perfect person for that is our former Public Works Director, Jay Spurgeon. Um, Jay Spurgeon, as a retired annuitant, a member of the CalPERS system, we have to comply with certain CalPERS rules in order to bring him back to perform these services. He has done this in the past with a past uh, rate case and is willing to come back uh, under those terms again. There are certain provisions that we have to, uh, we have to go through in, in order to do that. He's limited to 960 hours in a, in a year, um, and there is a, a pay range that we have to fall into, which we will do. Um, but the, uh, the recommendation is to authorize uh, the appointment of Jay Spurgeon as a retired annuitant hourly employee and authorize expenditure from the Public Works Temporary Hourly Employees Regular Pay uh, account. And with that, staff's available for any questions. Questions? Mr. Thank you, McNamee. Thank you, Mayor. In the, uh, for the sake of transparency in city government, what is that pay range in which uh, Mr. Spurgeon, who I am delighted he's willing to come back to the city, he's been a very, very loyal and reliable and a servant to the city of Thousand Oaks. I'm glad he's open to this idea. But for the sake of transparency, can we let the uh, public know what that pay range would be? I uh, wish I had that. I don't have that with me. What I can tell you, it is ex excessively below what he is able to charge as an independent contractor uh, when he is when he is able to perform that. Uh, it's not what we pay our, our contractors, it's what it's in the range of what we pay our part-time employees. So you could say it's uh, under $1,000 an hour, under well, 500? Well under 100. Uh, well under 100, okay, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at, so at least the public is aware of what and we're trying to be transparent here. This, and this, this would be considered a good deal for the city. I think that's yeah. a great idea. Thank you. I appreciate it. And Thank one you, of the things, One of the things I might add is um, when you're in these cases, often you have to hire outside experts. 
And in this case, um, uh, we happen to be fortunate to have had a, a public works director that was an expert in the field. Uh, it saves the taxpayer in the long run not to have to go out into the private marketplace and bring in an outside expert. I'm just, I'm just delighted he's willing to come back. Yeah. He's, he's a good asset. Just one quick question. The, the salary is, is the hourly rate. Uh, what is the, the benefits roll up on this type of? Um, as a retired annuitant, he's still he's drawing uh, benefits through that. So he is uh, would be in the same category as our other hourly employees, which are do not receive uh, the benefits package of our full time employees. Um, he his his benefits is is essentially the hourly uh, rate that he's paid plus his his uh, retired uh, pension. Very good, thank you. Any other discussion questions? Entertain a motion. I'd like to move uh, E, retired annuity, it's appointment, please. Madam Clerk. Councilmember Bill De La Pena? Yes. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember McNamee? Yes. Mayor Angler? Yes. And that motion carries 4 0 with Mayor Pro Temp Jones absent. Very good. We're going to skip down now to item 13 which is um, compensation uh, for our city attorney and city manager. Yes, uh, Mayor, members of the council. The, we have items 13A and 13B, and with the uh, uh, council's uh, permission, I'll take those two up together because they are related, but it does require separate votes on those two items. Um, the first, both the, uh, the city manager and the city attorney are uh, directly appointed by and employed by the city council. Part of their employment agreements requires an annual performance evaluation. Uh, the council had the opportunity um, on June 28th to meet and discuss uh, their, the performance of their employees and to provide feedback for their employees. Uh, their agreements also uh, provide the opportunity for the council on an annual basis to consider the compensation uh, for those two uh, employees. On the 28th, the council met and deliberated on uh, adjustments to the contracts for each the uh, city manager and the city attorney. They provided direction. They did not make a decision, but they provided direction uh, to the mayor and the human resources director as their negotiating team uh, to be able to provide uh, uh, a, a compensation adjustment. Um, Following that meeting, the uh, meeting was held between the mayor and uh, separately the city manager and the city attorney to discuss those ranges. And so what is before you today is approval of uh, adjustments to the agreement, the employment agreement for the city manager and the city attorney and amendments to those, those employment agreements to reflect that change. Uh, for each of those, the proposed change is 4% uh, of their salary and that is within the um, authority that was granted by the city council in the discussion. Um, and uh, the, the amendments are before you and, and are in line and uh, for approval. And with that, I'm available for any questions that you might have. And again, just to remind you that it does require a separate motion for each of those two amendments. Thank you, Mr. Giles. Questions from my colleagues? Go ahead, Mr. McNamee. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Giles, the 4%, that is to the base salary, is that also to the retirement plan, to the benefits? Where does that 4% get applied? 4% is to salary only. If we'd break that out into uh, city manager versus city attorney, at a 4% increase, what would be the total compensation for city manager, what would be the total compensation for city attorney, salary, benefits, retirement? What would those numbers be? Uh, we, don't have, we don't have the total numbers because the benefits are a complex formula. Uh, the retirement uh, particularly is a, a formula that is, is based upon uh, the age at which they retire, the number of years that they have uh, invested in the system at the time that they retire. Um, as well as whatever their single highest year's um, uh, uh, salary is. So particularly for the, for the um, 
for the, for the uh, retirement portion, the pension portion, that, that's a, a number that you can't discern at, at this point because it's something that is set based upon a CalPERS formula um, that is, is decided um, later at the time that they, that they retire and are entered Are we retirement. not putting money into the retirement plan right now? Uh, yes, the, that's the, the finance. Number, that's the number I'm looking at annually. Okay. I would be able to get that and bring that back to you. Um, that, the, the number that is set aside um, by the finance department is, is again, is, is also based upon uh, a maximum exposure. Um, but, but I certainly can gather that information and provide that back to you. So then let's just work with the benefits and the salary. Could you give me what those numbers would be for their total package there for just salary and benefits? Uh, again, the only adjustment that, that was proposed by the council was to the salary, so I have the salary numbers here. Let's go with that then if that's all you've got. Okay. Um, the, the total city manager salary with the proposed adjustment would be $291,671. The proposed total salary, uh, let me make sure I did that. Yep, city manager. The proposed total salary um, for the city attorney would be $294,343 annually. Now, if I go to Transparent California, they list this information on their website. Is it an accurate, fairly close number when they do the retirement benefits and salaries? I would say that it is not accurate, but it is within the ballpark. It, it does give you a, a ballpark number. Uh, my experience is that, that their numbers are uh, not current, and, and generally uh, when you look at how that information is provided to them, the sources that they glean from, a lot of times you're getting some apples and oranges mixed in together, but out of that I would say that uh, in order of magnitude, the, that Transparent California uh, does give you a, a rough approximation of the total benefits package. Last year we gave them, I believe, 4.5%, but they deferred during COVID any pay increases during that time period. We're giving another 4% to salaries again this year. And uh, if I remember correctly, last year when I looked up under transparentcalifornia.com, if I remember correctly, that was going to put them over 400000 per year for each one of them, including retirement benefits and salary. Does that sound about right? My recollection was that the total benefits package that Transparent America was reporting was in the upper 300s. So okay. that would not be far off. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Other questions? Quick question on, on the salary. What was CPI last year uh, in, in the LA Long Beach area? You know, I don't have the uh, uh, CPI, but it, it, it as, as we're all acutely aware, it has been uh, growing at a, at a very uh, fast pace. Um, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to say, and again, that's going to look at which months you're looking at and, and over, over. Right. But we were, we were looking at, at six to eight at, at times. So. Yeah, I remember seeing it someplace north of seven. Yeah, so I, I would say that's is it Is it fair to say that these are our, our, our only two employees, more or less, um, agreed for half a CPI? Is that about right? I, I would say that that is a fair characterization of uh, of the result. Uh, I don't think that it was necessarily put that way either by the council or by the by them. But I would say that that's uh, that that would be a uh, a fair understanding of the impact of this. So in some ways, they're actually making less uh, spendable money. I mean, they're they, they're at a high salary. I understand, but they are making a little bit less than they were last year. In, in, in terms of actual spending power spending of power. the dollars, uh, yes, that would be accurate. Okay, very good. Any other comments or motions? I'm sorry, uh, motion or comments? I, I'd just like to make a comment is that uh, in my evaluation of both city manager and city attorney, in my opinion, they have do an exemplary work. They've been such a pleasure to work with City manager is an incredible multitasker, keeps things on track, works with many personalities, city council included, and they both do a phenomenal job. I have such a 
uh, as I fondly say to her, a, our city attorney, that I have a love-hate relationship with her because I love her sense of knowledge of the law. But boy, I don't like the answers I get simply because that's just the way Sacramento and the laws are in, in the United States and California. So any vote I make here is no reflection on their work performance. I think it's phenomenal. Can't praise them enough. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Uh, McNamee. Uh, comments or a uh, motion? Oh, I have a motion if you're ready. I'm ready. Did you have a comment? Oh, all right. Um, well, I'll just say in general, I think that this city council, thanks to, in great part, thanks to our city manager and the support that the city attorney gives him, had one of the most productive years since I've been on the council, and, and maybe in decades. I mean, you look at some of the stuff that we've accomplished, uh, meeting critical housing needs, switching a, a, a trash collection agency after decades to save our residents millions of dollars, uh, coming forward with a proposal for per permanent supportive housing for our homeless uh, people. That's just to name a few. Uh, a very productive year, and um, you know, every year we set priorities and it's one thing to set priorities, it's another thing to see them actually carried out, and they were carried out this year. And uh, to me, um, the salary increase sends a message that results will be rewarded, not just with the city manager and the city attorney, but all the way down. Uh, it sends a message to all our employees that if, if you can provide results, we appreciate that, and we will re reward those results. So. I, I, so I need two separate motions, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Well, let's, uh, we'll start with the city manager. I'll move, um, what is it, Bob, 10? No, uh, it's a 10, 13 13A. 13A. 13A is the city I'm attorney. Sorry, 13B. 13 13B. 13, we're voting on 13A, correct? Uh, well, no, we're looking at the um, uh, city manager first off. That was the motion, so 13B. 13B first then. Okay. Yes. Do you have a comment to that? Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I agree with what was said by Council Member Al Adam. I you know I haven't always agreed with staff recommendation, and they they know that. <laughs> they uh, we have a very open channel of communication, and so we're not afraid to um, state our opinions, and I appreciate that very much. I also wanted to say that, um, as you mentioned, Mr. Giles, that the uh, the four percent is within the range that was unanimously approved by council in discussion. So I appreciate that very much. Um, Drew knows how much I respect him, and that will not change. And I am very much in favor of approving this motion. Thank you, Ms. Builder de Pena. I think the, I'll just add uh, for for our city manager. Um, this, as I, as Mr. Adams said, was an extremely productive year. Um, I, I point to just one one item: uh, almost a thousand new housing units approved, um, with over a hundred, almost 115 uh, affordable housing for low and very low income housing. That is more housing that's been that was approved in the prior 15 years, uh, and more uh, affordable housing since um, the uh, redevelopment agency went away in 2012. It is a, a tip of the hat to our staff and to the leader of that staff, uh, Mr. Powers. So, with that, I'll call for the vote. Councilmember Bill De La Pena. Yes. Councilmember Adam. Yes. Council Member McNamee? Regretfully, no. Mayor Engler? Yes. And that motion carries 3 1 with Council Member McNamee voting no and Mayor Pro Tem Jones absent. Very good. Do I have a motion on 13A? So moved yep. on 13A. <laughs> very, very good. Quick on, the, quick on the draw, Mr. Adam. Um, any comments on or discussion on 13A? Ms. Bill de la Pena. 
just as they were on 13B. Uh, we have a fantastic team with Drew and Powers and uh, Tracy Noonan, and as is the case with our city attorney, uh, the range of 4% once again, as Mr. Giles stated, was approved unanimously by council in discussion. Thank you. Very good. Other comments? Well, I'll just say that uh, the city attorney labors a lot behind the scenes to make sure everything we're doing is legally correct and, uh, and workable. And that's a huge project, believe me. Just what we've gone through with this trash hauling alone has been monumentally difficult, but with again, with great results. Great, great results. And uh, I will also say that our city attorney provides us a very valuable service here on the dais. And when we have questions, she has the right answers and she keeps us on track. And that's, to me, um, very important. So. I will agree with my motion. <laughs> uh, our, our, um, our assistant c uh, city attorney notwithstanding, having uh, uh, Ms. Noonan up here is a, bit, is a real benefit. Um, as, I, as I shared with my colleagues um, last week, an example of her work that you, no one really ever sees if you remember during our um, uh, transition for the trash hauler, uh, we, were, we were sued by the prior trash hauler, brought into court, the judge took one look at it and based on the work of Ms. Noonan, summarily dismissed the suit. Um, that's the type of work that she does. It's not, it's not out there, people don't see it that often, but that's what we rely on up here. So. Kudos to her, and I'll entertain a, uh, the vote. Councilmember Bill de la Pena? Yes. Councilmember Adam? Yes. Councilmember McNamee? Again, regretfully, no. Mayor Angler? Yes. And that motion carries 3 1 with Councilmember McNamee voting no, and Mayor Pro Tem Jones absent. Next up, we do have um, our city manager returning. Um, we, we do have some city manager comments, and then we will go into uh, our rest of our meeting. Thank you so much, Mayor Engler. Uh, just a note of appreciation for entirety of the city council um, for your ongoing support of uh, uh, not just myself and Tracy, but for this entire city organization. Uh, it's an amazing team. Uh, it is a team that has accomplished, uh, I believe, as Councilmember Adam mentioned, probably one of the most prolifically productive years in our city's history. I'm extremely proud of uh, our organization, uh, of our executive leadership team, and, and all of those that uh, support uh, this place, our businesses and residents in, in Thousand Oaks to make this such a wonderful place to live. Uh, I am uh, very humbled, very appreciative to continue to, to uh, uh, help lead this organization. Um, tonight uh, wraps up that very, very busy business here for the council. Um, I know the council is feeling it just like the rest of the team is feeling it. There's been a lot on the plate. Uh, so this is uh, the beginning of our council recess. Next meeting will uh, be on um, Tuesday, the 30th of August. Uh, right now, two items set on the agenda, an update on the drought and uh, the review of the crossing guard program policy um, that uh, was asked for by the city council. I'm sure there will be other items that take shape over the intervening time. Uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful um, uh, summer and, and take some time to relax with family and friends. Thank you, Mr. Powers, and um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, Assistant City Attorney. Uh, we do have some closed sessions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We have two closed sessions tonight. The first one is pending litigation, Caitlin Clint versus Fred Gessler and City of Thousand Oaks. It is a venue in Ventura County Superior Court, and this is pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9, Subdivision A. The second one is pending litigation as well. City of Thousand Oaks et al. versus California Regional Water Quality Board. It's also venued in Ventura County Superior Court, and this is also pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9, Subdivision A. There will be nothing to report out. Thank you.
Madam Clerk, we do have a public notice. Do you need to read that? Very good. Well, with that, I'm going to adjourn our meeting till our next regularly scheduled meeting at the end of August. Enjoy the summer. We will have a very spirited time when we get back. Uh, it's been a great year and look forward to our, the second half of our year. <laughs>